heard of uh, Mike Gold, G-O-L-D. He wrote an autobiography called Jews Without Money, in which he quotes his mother quite often. His mother who worked in a restaurant on New York's Lower East Side, and he tells us the story of her grabbing hold of him and saying with a wild look, at her, Mikey, Mikey, mm. promise me one thing, so long as you live you'll never eat a hamburger, because they were made okay. you know, of trash or anything. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I cut this in, in half. It would be easier to eat. Thank you. Up Sinclair. I was writing to expose the horrible working conditions under which the New York employees were living. But what he wrote attracted attention of people who became afraid of what they were eating. And Sinclair said, I aimed for the nation's heart and hit its stomach. <laughs> How long ago mm -hmm. in New York? I was born there. Except for one year, I lived there until I went away to university. There are areas in which, when they rented apartments, they would have such phrases as churches nearby which you understood to mean Jews not wanted. So they had a program on slum clearance, is what they called it. It actually meant poor people clearance. Mm -hmm. The city used the right of eminent domain, do you know that expression? See, even if you owned a building, the city could kick you out of it by the right of eminent domain. That is, it had the... It was really within the authority of the city to declare that people had to leave a certain area for certain social purposes, like tearing down the slums. Once the slums were teared down, torn down, they were, the, the area was re-rented and new buildings were put up. That didn't mean that the people who used to live there could go back and live there again. They couldn't afford to. And that was the case where Stuyvesant Town stands. It's, it's just below the UN. Of course, that was before the UN. And Metropolitan was given the right, uh, which was as uh, owners, uh, to rent to whomever they wanted. And they decided they would rent only to white people. You know about that? That's what became the big scandal. <laughs>
in Stuyvesant Town. I was on the faculty of City College, which looked like a good stable job. Teachers and lawyers and firemen and policemen and high-level city employees live there. Not now. They're moving out to the suburbs and the rich are living there. But they always had this exclusionary principle of not, allow, of not allowing non-whites to live there. Metropolitan announced that publicly. There was no secret about it. Uh, the NAACP, the American Jewish Congress, uh, Ethical Culture Society, and other organizations went to court over it. And the courts held that Metropolitan could rent to whomever it wanted. Vice Chair. Vice Chair of what? Of the Tenants Committee to End Discrimination in Stuyvesant Town. I was teaching at City College, and uh, I was mysteriously dropped from the City College faculty, although I had been recommended for promotion, even. And, uh, so I lost that job, and I went, uh, fortunately I was able okay. to get another job at Penn State. Okay. And instead of giving up the apartment we occupied in Stuyvesant Town, we kept the apartment and invited black friends of ours to occupy it as our guests. Penn State authorities denounced me for this action. There was a big story in the Times about it in September 1950. And uh, as a result of the hubbub, Penn State authorities also dropped me from, from the faculty. So I was at Penn State just for one year after having been criticized by the then head of Penn State for actions which he said were illegal and immoral and damaging to the public relations of the college. And then we had to look for another job. talking and um, he uh, I wondered about the various universities he'd um, uh, been associated with and City University in New York was one of them and Fisk University I got a job at Fisk University a, a university in Nashville Tennessee uh, dedicated to the education of black students. It was a novel experience. My, uh, my daughter went to a previously all-black school in Nashville. One a demonstration school operated by the college to which I was going. I taught mathematics. We continued activities in the civil rights issue. And 
there were some struggles when the Mathematics Association of America held a meeting in Nashville and at the banquet would not admit black colleagues. I was then called before the House Committee on Un-American Activities denounced as a communist and uh, dropped from the faculty at Fisk. Dr. Lorch had lost his professorship at Penn State University because he had sublet his apartment to a black family. This story aroused admiration in all of the students of the service. We were black. And this story of a white sacrificing for a black family in 1950 was unforgettable. He believed the students could understand the material, not just how to do it. He was interested in teaching them the why of mathematics in addition to the how. I had become chair of a committee to defend this young black student who had been accused of rape by a white divorcee. There wasn't anything to it. But it created a local uproar. And I became vice president of the Tennessee Conference of NAACP branches. So in Nashville, we maintain our anti-racist activities locally as well as maintaining our stance in respect to Stuyvesant Town. And after that was finished, I got a job at Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas, a black college operated by one of the churches. I was there for a couple of years before the Little Rock crisis erupted and I was forced out again. The governor of the state, Forbes, decided that the only way that he could hope for a third term was to create a local crisis and did so. Closed the, he closed the schools one year and again this was a widely reported episode uh, organized a mob to keep black kids out of the formerly old white school one of the my, my wife was present on that occasion and rescued one of the black kids from a gathering white mob. I'll leave the book on right here and, and the pen is there too. Standing by my bed, they framed you on a murder charge, says Joe, but I did, says Joe, but I did. The car.
robber bosses killed you, Joe. They shot you, Joe, says I. Takes more than guns to kill a man, says Joe. I didn't die, says Joe. I didn't die. And standing there as big as life, and smiling with his eyes, says Joe, what they can never kill went on to organize, went on to organize. From San Diego up to Maine, in every mine and mill, where workers strike and organize, it's there you find your hill. It's there students in the black colleges of the South were fired or expelled for participating in the Freedom Rides for desegregation. I, I had a question about these various colleges that uh, had been set up? The black colleges were set up in two different major categories. One were the state colleges that were set up in order to head off the desegregation struggles so they could say they were providing education for everybody. And the other were colleges that were set up by various churches as a support for desegregation. See, the different churches set up their own organizations. For example, the so-called AMA churches it was set up by the Congregationalist Church. Well, I was religious long enough to get bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> I never had much faith in religion. There were uh, th threats against the school, threats against me, threats against my wife, against my daughter, and uh, eventually uh, the situation became very tense. And in uh, The president of the college began to waver, and first he asked me to resign. And then he changed his mind and decided to stick it out. And uh, some compromise was reached whereby I took a job for one year at another Methodist college and took leave of absence from the college in Little Rock. At the end of that year, the president of Philander Smith asked me not to come back. I was never actually fired. The big trouble was the effort to enroll my daughter in the public school nearest our home the previously all-black school, and also my refusal to answer questions before the House on american Committee. But they didn't charge you with contempt of Congress, did they? 
They did charge me with that, but I was acquitted. Well, how, how did that work? The, uh, I was tried in federal court, and the, uh, the judge agreed with me that the questions put me lacked precision and uh, uh, were vague, and uh, he dismissed the charges. support and various struggles in which I was engaged, especially the Stuyvesant Town struggle in New York, the struggle against segregation and housing, which was a, a national issue. And I had met him on several occasions as a result of that. Was there a particular song that you liked that he sang? Well, I liked all of them, but uh, uh, his singing moved me greatly. Old Man River, for example. He was a person of infinite courage, infinite ability, and great modesty. Uh, a number of outstanding figures came to my support at various times. Another was Einstein. When I was fired from Penn State for refusing to give up the fight against housing segregation, uh, the Times had a big article about it, which Einstein read. And he sent for me to discuss it further. It was a very interesting session. Well, he asked me many questions uh, about the details of the struggles against segregation and encouraged me to continue in that struggle. He was very warm and friendly and very supportive. He was also easy to talk with after the first couple of minutes. I didn't, I didn't feel uh, on exhibition, but just in a, con in a conversation with him. That's easy. She was on the executive of the uh, Boston Teachers Union, and I was uh, a member of the uh, Teachers Union in, in Cincinnati while I was a student, as, uh, and uh, we met at a convention. That's how we met, and we found that we agreed on the issues which were under, under debate at the time and became friendly, and eventually more than friendly. She was a very vivid and committed person. and very good looking. Yeah, she was a full participant in all the struggles. She wasn't a hitchhiker. She was there.
I think our daughter was already in at least junior high school when we came to Edmonton. That would have been 1958. There was a Communist Party in Alberta. We knew its leadership and uh, cooperated in, in its activities. There were members of the Communist Party on the faculty of the University of Alberta. Uh, not a large number, but they were there. Uh, and uh, certainly that was the case in other Canadian universities. In fact, the first communist elected to office in North America was from Manitoba. It was usual to assume that the people who uh, uh, supported integration would be sympathetic to, uh, to the communist movement because the communists had a, uh, you might say, glorious history in fighting against racism so that they were willing to do it when other groups were not. And the result is that the failure of other groups to step forward uh, on that meant that uh, it was more or less automatically assumed that uh, people who, who fought against racism would be communists or sympathetic to communism. Mm -hmm. so in the, in the, the U.S., uh, racism was endemic, and it was not only in practice, but it was in law. And there were many people who uh, uh, left the U.S. on that account and went to the Soviet Union, which was the only country which had legislation against racism. Where did you meet him? In, in the course of some of the struggles uh, against segregation, housing, he was supportive of the struggle to desegregate Southern Town in New York, which became a national issue, a national symbol. And he f he fought against lynching and you know all the other horrors of the day. Very strong character. Very intelligent. Uh, very learned. His uh, his PhD thesis which he did, did at Harvard, was published as volume one of the Harvard Historical Series. Uh, he was a sociologist of great standing. Um, he, a man of genius. Very calm and very dig dignified but very firm. See, the Harlem Renaissance the, uh, was in my early youth, so I played no role in it, but I went to its events. M music, poetry, you name it. It, it was featured there, theatre as well.
it was a vital part of, uh, of culture. A truly vital part. And they created enthusiasm and hope. They gave life to the city. You see, the rise of the Nazis in Germany gave a certain segment of the Jewish population fears of, of concerning racism. And while not all Jews by any means were sympathetic to the black liberation movement, there were a sufficient number who were and who were supported uh, in their uh, out, outlook by their own concerns about the impact of racism. I never felt any opposition from my parents to my participation in the struggle against racism. Well, some of these events, some of my childhood and my relations with my parents, mm -hmm. a deeper appreciation of my parents. I don't sleep at night. I go to bed and uh, quite often I can't sleep. And uh, on those occasions I keep, you know, thinking about the past. sometimes the remote past. It always brings me great pleasure to think about my daughter's early childhood. Uh, little kids bring their parents unrequited love. Mm -hmm. 19 by 4 need help. 19 by 4 need help. Nineteen by four. Nurses. Yeah, it's just a different room. Mm -hmm. One of my daughters favorite occupations as a small child was to grow, crawl into bed between my wife and myself in the early hours of the small morning when she was already awake but we were asleep. <laughs> She'd climb over me to scrunch in between my wife and myself and put one arm around my wife and one about me. The whole family is here. <laughs> there are a lot of reminiscences of that kind that, that I think of sometimes 
Looks like usually more than once. Martin, you must have thoughts about your children's early life. Well, yes. So nice to look at pictures from that period. Mm. It's nice to look at pictures from that period. I can't hear you. It's it's nice to look at photos and so on. Yes. From that period, yeah. Doesn't seem so long ago, but uh, mm. it doesn't seem so long, but no. uh, it, it's a good but many it is, years. Yes. It is. The big uh, airplane, it, well, it yeah. used to be an airplane company, has been put back for a few months. But uh, uh, I had some phone contact with her when you first came in to fight for peace an answer for her crime, refusing to fill out the 2011 census form. How are the two related? The census was processed with optic recognition software supplied by Lockheed Martin, the same company that produces cluster bombs and Trident missiles. Well, I was attracted to math. Uh, uh, because of its elegance, because I was encouraged to go in that direction. Uh, my father would have had talent in that direction if he'd had a chance for an education. And one of my mother's closest friends was a high school math teacher, and she used to come have supper with us every Tuesday night and talk to ma talk afterwards to me about math. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of encouragement. The match was a classic. <clears throat> See, Max Schmeling uh, was a, a German, a, a Nazi, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Uh, the German propaganda before that match was that uh, no black man could stand up against an Aryan. Mm. And it was turned into a political matter. And uh, uh, Schmeling issued, or his lawyer for him, issued all kinds of statements uh, of a racist character. And then the and the fight was held uh, here, here in New York, I think. And uh, Harlem was just loaded at the time. And uh, there were big parties held to watch the fight. I was at one of them in the heart of Harlem. <laughs> I had to go to the washroom so was just before the fight started and I, I came out of the washroom and the room was being emptied. I said, and I asked, well, what are you folks leaving? Is it, aren't you going to start the fight? Hell, the fight's over now. <laughs> uh, Lewis uh, knocked spelling out in a matter of seconds. upon you men now of the terrific responsibility you have in this ring tonight.
<laughs> Lenox Avenue is a very wide avenue. And people were shoulder to shoulder across that avenue for block after block. Mm -hmm. All of Harlem turned out. Hitler sent Schmeling, Lewis sent him back. It was a very energizing evening. There were difficulties. You know, I was lucky in that I was able to go from one job to another. Some people were driven completely out of the profession, but women women were very badly discriminated against in those days. Not not just uh, not just blacks, not just Jews but also women of whatever category. And uh, if you had to relocate, it meant that the family had to do the same. Mm -hmm. Which meant a new circle of friends, Kids going into different schools, losing their playmates. Mm -hmm. There were some very rough times for my daughter at that time. She had fights with some of the segregationist kids, of course in the school in Arkansas. But I, ha I had to take her to school. I couldn't uh, let her go by herself. I uh, okay. picked her up also. Because mm -hmm. you couldn't tell what's going to happen in the street. She needed a lot more protection in those days. Mm -hmm. More than she realized. Nice. Fortunately. Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of like recommendations or anything for people who are who are activists who are working? Keep at it. Area? Keep at it. Uh, don't let things go slide by. Mm -hmm. I met some very decent people in this respect. By the way, uh, it's easy to. Uh, list the phonies, but there were a lot of people uh, who came out of the woodwork on the right side. Mm -hmm. Was it Joe Lewis who said, it ain't over till it's over? It ain't over till it's over. What? Somebody like that. Yes. Maybe um, Yogi Berra, was it? Anyway, it ain't over till it's over. Called the Mississippi, that's the old man I don't like to be. What does he care if the world's got troubles? What does he care if the land ain't free? But don't say nothing, he just keeps rolling, he keeps on.